A couple of weeks ago, I showed you the Predator from Air Force One, a new release, and now I have another one. This is the Chinese H6K Long Range Strategic Bomber. Hi, Misha here, and it's another 172 scale diecast. And, uh, well, this one is so big that it won't fit on the spinny thing. So we'll have to make do. In fact, it's so big it comes with a special stand with uh, well, two and then a, yeah, and then uh, two studs and even a screw to hold it on. You should see the box it came in. Quite massive. It, I'd say it's nearly 20 inches. <laughs> and this is a Chinese modernization based on the original Soviet Tupolev Tu-16, which was really Russia's first long-range strategic bomber that was jet powered. Before that, they had essentially relied on the TU-4 Bull, which was a Russian copy of the uh, B-29. But yeah, this uses two jet engines, and depending on the variant, can lift about 20,000 to 26,000 pounds either in an internal bomb bay or under the wings. And depending on the exact version, has a crew of anywhere from four to seven. The original Russian version was known as the Badger Bomber. Anyone who remembers the original Red Alert will remember the Badger from it. <laughs> and this is an interesting uh, model here from old Air Force One. They always do an interesting job with their uh, Chinese aircraft, so we'll do our best to look at this, although it is very large and thus rather hard to maneuver around. In some ways, the TU-16 Badger was kind of the equivalent, if not necessarily an overall payload, but in a general thing, to the American Boeing B-52. It first flew in 1952 and was in the uh, military service of Russia by 1954. And around 1958, <clears throat> a few examples were sent to China for them to try out, test out, what have you. And they would first fly theirs, although it was a Soviet make, in 1959. And somewhere around this time, or 1960, a deal was inked to give China a license to produce the uh, TU-16. And this would have been one of the last pieces of military hardware, certainly aircraft hardware, that Russia would lease to China, would license to China, because very soon thereafter, relations would, uh, would fall apart. And they would have a brief thaw around 1962-63, which is where the whole um, MiG-29, excuse me, MiG-21 copy came from, but then things would kind of get rough again. Nevertheless, China did have a few badgers, and in 1965, one of these would take a Chinese nuclear weapon into the air and do the first airdrop test of a Chinese nuke. <clears throat> and China would select the, uh, the Zayin, or ZN, aircraft factory, to manufacture their variant, which was designated the H-6. And by 1968, the first Chinese assembled one was off the production line, and in 69, it was first taken to the air. And after that, they would have different tests, uh, bombing tests and what have you, through 71, 72. And according to Wikipedia and whatnot, the CIA estimated that um, around 32 of these were in service by 1972, 
with uh, over a dozen on the production lines. Now that was the original H6. Now this is an H6K, and we'll talk about the difference. But the original H6 was essentially a straight copy of the Russian design with a few changes. And they would have several versions, including for conventional bombing and nuclear bombing, as well as a reconnaissance version, and eventually an aerial refueling tanker version. So they were getting their, their money's worth out of this, just as America has done with their B-52s. And most built would be for the Chinese People's Army Air Force, but some were also for the Chinese the Navy, the People's Navy Air Force, and a few were exported, but only a few. The two major export users were Egypt, who by the mid and late 70s found themselves on the outs with Russia too, so China stepped in and supplied some of the uh, H6D variant to, to Egypt in the 1980s. And more interestingly, and the one that really saw combat service, in the uh, early mid-80s, four H-60s were provided to Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And these would actually be used in real warfare, live warfare, against Iran, including attacking some oil tankers and whatnot in 1988 and at the end of the war in 1989. Of the four, one of them would be lost to Iranian forces. I think it was an F-14 that shot one down. And the other three would exist for a brief time until they were destroyed while still on the ground during Operation Desert Storm in 1991, January. Rotating this thing around, I realize this might be one of my absolute heaviest die-cast models because it is almost all entirely metal. The tail is metal. Stabilizers, metal, wings. That's the one thing that the Air Force One is good at, is lots of metal, including in their stands. So you have to give them credit there. Of course, the Tu-16 would continue in Soviet service, being retired after the fall of the uh, communist regime there, and replaced by slightly newer bombers. And in China, really at this time, they were only getting started. Of course, production did not ramp up until the 70s, and throughout the 80s, they would have several variants. And in the 90s, they would both refurbish existing aircraft, as well as come up with several new versions. And this version here, the H6K, well, the prototype would first be seen in 2007 and these would enter into Chinese Army Air Force service towards the end of 2009 and no one knows exactly how many are in Chinese service today but probably over 200 in the Army and uh, you know 30 or 40 in the Navy but, of course, Iraq has retired theirs, retired meaning they're all destroyed. And Egypt retired theirs in 2000 when they were going through their own military changes and, and budget cuts. So with that, let's talk about this variant here. Why it is still perhaps valid in the uh, 21st century. What China hopes to... Uh, to gain out of it and talk about its tech specs. Well, I thought when I put it on the stand, maybe I could put it on the spinny thing, but now the problem is it's about eight foot tall. So I tried. <laughs> the, um, the original H6 was a conventional bomber. The H6A was for nuclear bombing. And these are just um, kind of internal bomb bay, you know, just drop it over a target, dumb bomb type delivery. The H-6B was interesting. It was a reconnaissance variant. And the H-6C 
and the H-6E were both updates of the original versions, conventional and nuclear bombing, but with uh, slightly improved countermeasures and updated systems. The H-6D, the one that was kind of uh, exported, this was a, an anti-shipping variant that could carry two silkworm, NATO codename, anti-shipping missiles, one under each wing. It also had a new, improved radar on the underside there, or in the nose, I should say. And so the H-6D was quite successful. Next, we get the H-6F, which was a modernization program of the older variants in the 1990s. They received new uh, nav navigation systems, GPS, some uh, radar updates, what have you. They also started pulling off some of the defensive guns. Originally, the Russian and, of course, the Chinese variants had a remote-controlled turret on the top and bottom, dorsal and ventral positions, each having two 23mm cannon. And then there was a manned turret in the rear with two more 23mm cannon. And then there was a seventh optional 23mm cannon in the nose that wasn't always used. But they would start pulling these off because, I mean, what's the, what's the point? They don't really have much practicality. So into the 90s, we're getting into the cruise missile versions. The H-6G was a control plane for ground-launched, so surface-to-surface -surface cruise missiles. And the H-6H was itself a cruise missile launch platform carrying two cruise missiles. So kind of like the H-6D, but for surface attacks, land attacks more than naval. This was followed on by the H-6M, which was the first version really dedicated to carrying missiles. It, it had a total of four hard points, two under each wing. And it also had an improved radar and electronic systems. Now, interestingly, this version did not have an internal bomb bay at all. Uh, they're kind of getting away from this. And now we come to the H-6K here. This version was, again, the prototype was ready by the beginning of 2007. And it had a total of six hard points under the wings. With the K, they removed all the defensive guns. They added new modern electronic countermeasures. They filled in the glass nose where the navigator used to be with an updated radome. Later versions could even have aerial refueling. And just generally speaking, a more modern cockpit. It was a glass cockpit with updated displays, more modern communications gear, and probably most importantly, we had enlarged engine intakes here because we're using more powerful engines. Now, at this time, these engines are, are sourced from Russia, although... It seems like there have been trials and testing in China to make a domestic engine. Anyway, more you know, more powerful engines because of the heavier payload. It also seems as if at least some of the K versions can have an internal bomb bay. This is a large aircraft, but not ginormous by modern standards. It's about 114 by 108 feet. Has a max altitude of about 42,000 feet. And originally it had a top speed of about 650 miles per hour, but the updated versions like this could get up to about 660, a little bit faster. And they had a cruise speed of between 490 and 500 miles per hour. But the idea, this could either carry cruise missiles or anti-shipping missiles. And it wasn't really supposed to be for nuclear delivery. It can still carry nuclear weapons, but that in China is really left up to uh, you know, missiles from silos on the ground or submarines. Rather, this was there to threaten 
naval targets like, oh, I don't know, American aircraft carrier groups. In fact, with the modern anti-shipping missiles these carry, they can fire them at, oh, at about a thousand miles away and still hit their target, and they are supersonic. Kind of interesting there. So yeah, this model is of the H6K. There's also a variant known as the H6J. It's for the Navy. It's not obviously going to operate off their aircraft carriers, but you know, from naval land bases. And there's even talk in the last couple of years about an improved version known as the H6N. But yeah. So they have definitely made quite the family out of this. And officially it's still in production in China today. And in case you're wondering, yeah, it's super heavy on its stand. I need to actually have someone weigh this for me. You can see the uh, rear here. That would have been where the turret would have gone, but now it's going to have electronic gear and countermeasures back there. The crew for this more modern version seems to be four. Essentially pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, and uh, electronics communications officer. And this really is a potential threat to um, naval targets. In fact, having this means that China is one of only a few nations, the U.S. and Russia, namely, that has a modern long-range strategic bomber with standoff capability because of the uh, cruise missiles. And since they are capable of aerial refueling, at least some of them now, it's uh, quite, quite potent. As I mentioned, there are versions of this that they themselves can refuel jet fighters. The original one was called the HI-6, and the more modern version is known as the HI-6U. These don't carry a whole lot of fuel, about half as much as a KC-135, but they can adequately refuel a couple of modern jet fighters. Again, it's really just showing China getting their, getting their money's worth out of this design. I'll have to give them credit there. Doing a good job there. Obviously, it has zero stealth capability, and it's still subsonic or at least transonic it's not a supersonic bomber but its ability to carry six long-range crews or anti-shipping missiles definitely makes it a threat this is kind of limited a little bit by the fact that china doesn't really have a adequate early warning surveillance electronic aircraft to feed it targeting data but, it still makes it a threat. And China was able to make this, produce this, quite economically. You know, again, we have a couple of hundred still in service. And, uh, they're still made by the Xi'an Aircraft Corporation today. So what about this uh, new model from Air Force One? As you see, it does have some moving parts for what it's worth. And it is mostly metal. Let's see if I can pick this up with you. Oh, this is heavy. <laughs> I see why they gave the little screw for the stand, which is good. And why the stand itself is so heavy. So, the good part is it is almost entirely metal. This in the front, this tube, has two pieces. You can either put a piece in with no tube or a piece with the tube. I just put it in with. We have a cockpit. It doesn't open or anything. We have the missiles on the wings. They come pre-installed. And these are plastic. 
We have two different types. And our body is metal. Our uh, engine is metal here. Now the one thing to note, it does come gear permanently in the down position. So we have rolling wheels. And then we have the doors. Not a lot of detail up inside here. But it's there. This has the four wheels here under the wings and they do move. I'm gonna set this just to you. How does that look like? <laughs> Maybe something you can see. It's impressive and it's in its uh, scope and scale. And the strikes on the wings. And this kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, Air Force One has been doing quite a few Chinese aircraft, but they tend to always be jet fighters. They haven't really done Chinese bombers. They have done American bombers from World War II, like uh, the B-17, the B-24, the B-25. I wonder if this is kind of them getting into something new. Fuel tank here. And I wonder if they're planning on doing an original TU-16 Badger. Because that would be neat. I would definitely be down for the Soviet version with the 23 millimeter, 23 millimeter excuse me, Makarov cannon and rear turret. I think that'd be pretty swell. In fact, if they want to do other... Soviet aircraft, I'd be down for that too, because we have a real dearth of com block bombers. Thanks to Corgi, we have pretty much all the British bombers, and we have the American bombers, but uh, that's about it. And bombers are pretty darn impressive. Pretty large one here, to say the least. So I just wanted to do a video on it. I'm impressed, and for as big and heavy as it is, Air Force One prices are eh, reasonable, let's say. This is around 100 bucks. So when you compare it to like a Corgi, maybe it's 120 130 I don't know. But you know, Corgi is charging $200 for like their B-17s now. But of course, to be fair, Corgis are a little nicer in the detail like this has a few visible screw holes and there's a bit of a seam here and the cockpit here is a little bit offset but it's a neat aircraft and very impressive in 172 scale typically this type of bomber if a company does it it'll be in uh, one 144 or even 1200 and now that they've done this what i think air force one really needs to do is revisit the notion of uh, doing a b29 in 172 a long time ago they kind of teased the idea that they would do one but when it came out it ended up being a 1 144 scale which is nice Sorry guys, I'm unsure. There we are, where my balance point is. <laughs> and the, the Air Force One 144 B-29 isn't bad, but I would like to see one in this scale, because it'd be a, about this size, and that would be darn impressive. You know what, I'll even put up with gear in the down position for that. Although... If they want to do, do gear up or down, they can do that too. It's kind of interesting. They released their Predator drone, and it came with these tiny little gear up or down. And they do this, and it has big old gear, and they're just in the down position. But overall, it's, it's, a, it's a really impressive model. And again, it's not just another B-17 or Lancaster, and those are cool, but... Just something you don't you don't get many of. In fact, the only other Soviet type bomber I have is a Corgi Tu4, and even that's in 
1, 144 scale. So what do you think? Worth it or not? Let me know in the comments. And this, I think, would be a difficult one for anyone to record, much less myself. So I hope I got something for you. As always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.